You are listening to the Foreign Policy Focus Podcast. We cannot wait for the final proof. The smoking gun could come in the form of a mushroom cloud. Have you driven enough people from their homes already? Bulldoze their villages, seize their property and their laws. They had no part in making now working in Libya with friends and allies, we've demonstrated what collective action can achieve in the 21st century. Now the host of the show, Kyle Inslee. This is episode 405 of the Foreign Policy Focus podcast. On today's show, I'm talking about running out of money, some updates on the Russiagate slash Ukraine gate saga, and then of course, a lot on today's show about what's going on in northeast Syria as it seems the Turkish invasion is now just getting underway. Please take the time to share the show. I recommend it to friends. The place you find the show online is the libertarianinstitute.org. On the homepage there, you find both the show and the daily news roundup that I write. If you're a new listener to the show and you like it, make sure you subscribe to the show somewhere. I update current events on the show, so the way you get the most out of it is by subscribing to the show and trying to catch as many episodes as possible. Last. Donate to the show at patreon.com slash foreign policy focus if you want to get in on the monthly live stream. Five bucks a month, uh, you can ask questions or join me uh, for a conversation there. And um, again, that is uh, patreon.com slash foreign policy focus. And this month's live stream is October 15th at 9 p.m. Eastern time. All right, so I'm talking about running out money on today's show. And no, I don't mean for the show itself. I'm talking about for the U.S. government and apparently the UN. In the US, we have this uh, magical thing called the Federal Reserve Bank, and by giving it the mystical powers of the government, it's able to just print money, and that money is, you know, in part used to fund the welfare state, but also a very major component of funding the warfare state. You know, a lot of people will point out, and the libertarians like to make this point, I think it's very accurate, and I probably don't talk about it enough on the show, that if we had to pay for these wars, you know, that there's estimates that it's like five or six trillion now that we've spent on the wars uh, since 9-11, then who knows how many of these wars we would actually be doing. You know, would people be holding more account on the uh, F-35 project if, let's say, people had bought bonds for the F-35 project and this was something that was supposed to cost a few hundred billion dollars and ends up costing more than a trillion? Uh, you know, would people be more, you know, careful about getting into a war in Libya or Syria if, let's say, the government had to raise, you know, money for those wars from the actual people so somebody would have to go out and buy the bonds and kind of invest in these wars? And, you know, I think that's a real possibility. I don't know how much it will help. I think uh, maybe th- there would just have to be a lot more propaganda to get people to buy into the wars. But, it, you know, it is an important point that the country is going broke. Um, it looks like the federal deficit, I'm guessing this is for the fiscal year, so that I think that runs from like September 30th, uh, you know, all the way through the next year, uh, rather than starting on like, you know, January 1st, uh, was $984 billion. So falling just shy of the trillion dollar mark, which has been hit four times. You know, everybody points out that, you know, the, these, Marks were hit in the midst of the the financial crisis, and, and that is definitely true. And I'm sure that's a large component of all the bailouts and stuff like that. But at the time, you know, we're in the middle of a bunch of wars too, and you know, the war debt is being racked up now. We're paying billions of dollars just on the debt from the wars that we started, like the war in Iraq, which we did need to get involved in. I think I have seen at least like on a local level. That when, you know, people have to pay shell out money, let's say for a new school, and then that school district comes back another years later and say, oh, we need another new school there. You know, well, what happened? Didn't we just build you a new school? Yeah, well, you know, there were all these mistakes and, and people seem a little bit more interested in accountability, although I'm not, you know, sure how much of a difference it'll make. And so, you know, let's say you do have something like Afghanistan, which, you know, at this point just seems to be a war that's going on with its own inertia and momentum, you know, for all the reasons that people don't want to lose their current jobs and nobody wants to admit to losing that we're still fighting the thing. Well, what if every year the U.S. government had to come back and, you know, the, the American people actually had to shell out uh, $60 billion or so? You know, we all had to dig into our own pockets and send the government some of our money. I think a lot more of us would be inclined to say, yeah, I, I'm going to keep my couple hundred bucks, even if it is just a couple hundred bucks, 
uh, because this thing isn't worth it anymore. You know, I'd rather be able to buy my kid a present or, you know, for some people, it's a little bit more desperate, maybe get caught up on bill a little bit more, pay off some of those student loan debts. Another thing about this and just thinking of is, I remember when I was growing up, you know, during the 90s and early 2000s, the kind of trope, I guess, during the Bush years was that, uh, you know, the, the Democrats opposed the military spending and the Republicans opposed the welfare spending. Um, and, and kind of what ends up happening is for this reason, everything gets funded. Well, I can't say that I could ever really see the Democrats opposing defense spending all that much, uh, you know, in my time since I, I've really become aware and start following the news. You know, at, at times, especially under the Obama administration, they were some of the biggest hots. Here we occasionally have Trump rolling back some spending, uh, whether it's aid to, to different countries, uh, you know, Ukraine, I guess, you know, there's some other issues going on there but even like pakistan egypt and other countries uh in eastern europe or you know funding less of the un or nato when trump floats this kind of stuff uh you know the, the democrats kind of go crazy and say no you can't do that and of course when trump would do things like start to end wars move troops out of syria afghanistan something like that again you know this would be a big thing that would save some money really reduces defense spending and yeah, you know, everybody goes crazy and says, oh my God, you know, Mr. President, you're nuts. You can't do this. So I, I really don't think it's true that the Democrats actually, you know, in any way, at least uniform ways, uh, oppose defense spending. Now here and there, each Democrat may have, you know, some issue like they don't like this particular weapon or this particular system or something like that. And so they'll oppose it or, you know, they, they support shutting down a base or two. Uh, but generally speaking, maybe minus like the Tulsi Gabbards, I, I don't see any real call to shrink the military budget, especially when you think, you know, they're crying for all this climate change and stuff like that. Well, they don't even look at the military budget as a place to get that money, even though the U.S. military is one of the you know world's largest uh, polluters. I have a note here that in that last fiscal year, the State Department approved $68 billion in, in weapon sales uh, to different countries. Now, the article I'll link to in the show notes page actually gets into, well, it, this doesn't mean that all those weapons actually went out. I, I think uh, several 10 to $20 billion of those sales were to Taiwan for tanks and, and uh, maybe F-15s. And the the writer was speculating that those may not all go through at, uh, because of protests and demands from China, even though the U.S.-Chinese relationship isn't going in great direction and seems the U.S. is uh, moving closer to Taiwan, uh, specifically the the military and increasing weapon sales there. Of course, it, you know if you're the Taiwanese government, you really, I guess, are probably taking a look at what's happening in the Middle East and with Saudi Arabia and saying that man, the Saudis are are really able to buy a lot from Donald Trump. I, you know, they got away with killing Jamal Khashoggi. They're waging this brutal and pointless war in Yemen. Uh, their provocative actions in, in the Middle East in general, but in Yemen and then. Uh, you know, with uh, Iran and the GCC, they've been able to get away with all that under Trump. And, you know, Trump still gives weapon sales and support to the Saudi government and helps them continue their war in Yemen. And when asked why, Trump says, well, you know, we we sell them weapons. It, it makes uh, money for us and creates jobs. So we have to do it. So maybe Taiwan sees that and says that way, the, you know, the way we uh, buy our way into the good graces of America and make sure that uh, you know, we continue our mutual defense treaty with America and get all these defense pats and really basically ensure that the Americans will act as a mercenary for should they ever get into conflict with uh, China. They're just going to keep buying our weapons. Other major weapon sales, you know, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, uh, different Middle East states. And, you know, this is just to think about part of the scam here is that the federal government funds all these different weapons programs uh, to the tune of, you know, millions and billions of dollars and then those weapons makers sell weapons to other countries and while the country is running a deficit so all of us you know are you know becoming less wealthy whether that's through inflation you know eventually we'll have to pay the the debt you know either through deficits or <laughs> somehow losing our money uh you know, either directly seized by the u.s government or something like that but right now you know they're able to then turn around and sell weapons to other countries and, and make a bunch of money off of it. And a lot of times those sales are facilitated by the U.S. All right, I also want to talk about apparently the U.N. running out of money. 
not quite sure how this is possible because you know the u.s gives them a lot of money every year but i I suppose this has already led to a reduction in some things that the you, you know u.n activities whether that's holding selective conferences in different places or uh, limiting some travel. Now, I don't particularly like the UN, so I don't. But I'm guessing the unfortunate thing is that if any activity does get cut, it'll probably be some of the legitimate like human rights work that the UN does. Uh, somebody like the Special Rapporteur for Torture traveling around Europe, talking to people and kind of exposing the, the what's happening to Julian Assange and how he's a victim of the United States and the world empire. The U.S. says they're about to give the U.N. a bunch of money and this should release uh, the shortfall. It's a waste of taxpayer money, largely. Uh, the, the small amount of money that's actually, you know, goes to the U.N. and probably does productive things and helps to, to bring, you know, maybe some tensions down in certain places. Like, you know, in Yemen, if the U.N. can sponsor and lease peace talks, well, you know, that's certainly a good thing, but... I think a lot of the money there is being wasted and very little is actually going to the things it needs to go to. All right, a few other stories from U.S. News that I just want to talk about briefly. This one is kind of funny and I'll link to it in the show notes page. A Defense One journalist, I guess, was unable to enter the country after a customs agent stopped him. I recently went through the process, so I know how kind of stupid it is. These people ask you questions like, what do you do? What are you doing here? Although, if you go with, you know, the wrong person's ticket up to the counter, uh, the, the guy doesn't even notice. But uh, anyway, so this journalist is sitting there, right? And uh, the guy goes, so what do you do? He goes, I'm a journalist. And, and the customs agent goes, you mean propagandist? And he goes, I'm a journalist. And the guy, again, says propagandist. This time, the, the journalist kind of, you know, wanting to get along with his day. Like, I hate talking to these people, too, says... For the purposes of speeding this conversation, I'm a propagandist, basically being like, whatever, dude, like, just let me go through. Um, the, the agent again makes him say that he's a propagandist. Uh, it, it's quite ridiculous. And I guess in this case, it's a little bit more funny since it is Defense One, which is, a, you know, pretty much just a Pentagon propaganda outlet, you know, pu- publishing a very, you know, oftentimes friendly uh, you know, kind of establishment thoughts on the war state, although, you know, occasionally a good article or two as well. A key figure in the Trump White House's uh, maximum pressure policy, uh, Seagal Mandelker. Uh, I've talked about her in the past on the show. She's a key architect of the maximum pressure uh, policy, specifically against Iran, very particular in, in making sure that we have as many sanctions against the Islamic Republic as possible. Very hawkish. And so her leaving the administration seems like a good thing to me. Uh, Very interesting that she exits after Bolton's kicked out. Maybe that has something to do with it. And then when a Russian lawmaker came to the FBI, uh, came to the U.S., they were detained by the FBI at a U.S. airport. Uh, I believe it was actually uh, Lambert in St. Louis uh, for uh, overnight having to answer questions. Russia is, I think, pretty ticked off about this and has summoned the U.S. ambassador. I can talk about what I just have as the Dash Gates in the show notes page here uh, because, you know, it's Russia Gates, Ukraine Gate. I mean, they have every kind of gate now with Trump. It, you know, it's a daily what's the, what's the new gate. Uh, but to talk about Russia Gate and uncovering the actual, uh, I think, conspiracy behind it. And that was, of course, the, the deep state trying to hem in Trump's uh, more America first, the better parts of his foreign policy by making up this fake Russian scandal, uh, you know, to go against him. Well, it turns out that Bob Barr has been traveling around the world, I guess, visiting a few other countries. Uh, this includes Rome to try to get some information on Mifsud. Uh, very interesting to see if he'll make it either to Ukraine or China, where Donald Trump has floated the ideas of you know, uh, Barr going there and working with them to try to, you know, get some of the information behind uh, how this whole fake conspiracy theory in Russiagate started. You know, some people have pointed out that while the, the Russiagate thing has somewhat faded from the news, it would be important to find out if, you know, the U.S. intelligence agencies were working with, you know, possibly even foreign intelligence to try to get dirt on Trump to spy on Trump in order to undermine his presidential campaign. I, you know, I don't particularly want President Donald Trump, but at the same time, I don't want the, you know, intelligence agencies running around and manipulating the U.S. election and trying to undermine the president 
especially if the the key component of the Trump presidency they had a problem with was his foreign policy uh, along the lines of, you know, kind of ending Middle East interventions and getting along better with Russia. And obviously he hasn't really done that. You know, we we talked in the show in the past about getting out the I uh, an F treaty and that being a big deal. Now he's talking about closing out the open skies treaty. Apparently, uh, last night, I believe Tuesday night, representative angle uh, submitted some kind of open letter that says, you know, I'm very concerned. I'm hearing that Trump is going to leave this treaty. The treaty is important because it allows the U S and Russia to fly different missions, uh, with spy planes, over each other's countries uh, to kind of understand what the military capabilities uh, of each country are. You might think, oh, wow, why would the United States give all this up? Well, you know, it's because we don't need to have these massive arm races with Russia and having a, a realistic understanding of what each other's military capabilities are. Uh, it keeps from, you know, these runaway fear type situations. Uh, there's an article in Wired that's very good uh, where they point out that I guess Eisenhower was, you know, kind of in a position where he was feeling like, oh, I really need to build up America's nuclear arsenal because we're getting all these reports that Russia's arsenal is very advanced and much larger than ours. And, uh, you know, it kind of turns out that the the Russian arsenal wasn't as advanced and Eisenhower was actually able to make a logical, uh, you know, understanding and defense policy, which doesn't actually happen. Just kind of step back a little bit from that. So another interesting story here is that, uh, you know, this kind of got wrapped up into Russiagate, but tangentially, like Maria Butina, who that really had nothing to do with Russiagate, she ends up going down for it. Well, the, the, the poisoning of the Skripals, if we remember back, I believe that's May or March of 2017, Sergei and his daughter Yulia, Sergei being a, a former Russia defector, poisoned on a park bench in the UK uh, city of Salisbury. Kits off a firestorm that Putin had to be behind this and that this was Russia, uh, you know, kind of a catching on with the Russiagate hysteria. Uh, turns out that the evidence for this is pretty thin and there, there's still really, uh, you know, questions about it. If this was Russia behind it, I tend to think it wasn't. Um, and, and there's reasons for this. And, you know, people like Gareth Porter have done, uh, Gareth Porter have done great reporting on this, you know, kind of pointing out that the only leg that the you know pro Russia did it people have to stand on is that they say oh the the particular nerve agent used a nova choke was only able to be produced in Russia because you know the Soviets came up with it and, and Gareth points out that no like the, there's supplies of this that that have gotten out and anybody in in a well you know maintained lab you know very sophisticated not something that you know the local community college is going to have but advanced colleges and countries will have uh, labs capable of producing these agents. A couple stories on Germany. A U.S. F-16 crashed there. The pilot safely ejected. In Greece, the U.S. signed a new defense pact and will be building a new air and naval base in northwest Greece. I I find this interesting because I guess this base will be used to resupply NATO forces in the Baltics when... Uh, previously, I guess the U.S. had done that more through Turkey. And so I think it's just showing, you know, one of the repercussions of the Syrian civil war gain in bed with the Kurds there is having to move further away from Turkey. And not that I particularly think Russia is a threat of any kind. And we need, need the NATO built up in the Baltic states and on Russia's border. You know, the point I'm trying to make is, is that if you're one of these people, that believe that Russia is the ultimate threat, it, it seems awfully stupid to be doing things in Syria where you have a, a kind of a regional situation where who cares if Assad's president, if you know we're talking about nuclear war with Russia. And so why would you move further away from Turkey? Uh, you know, but this is the situation that we're in. I'm sure it's going to cost tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars to build this stupid base. In North Korea, off the coast there, Japan says that a North Korean fishing ship rammed a Japanese frigate of some kind. Uh, it doesn't seem like there is any damage to the Japanese ship. And then they found uh, 60 North Koreans on board, and I guess they were arrested, detained, rescued, all depending on how you want to uh, classify it, that encounter. But this seems to be something that's going on uh, now, not only with Russia, but also with Japan, that North Korean fishermen are getting themselves caught by these countries and i really wonder if the either one the north koreans are really desperate 
at this point. They're just trying to fish uh, further and further away from their shores and then are, you know, violating whatever territorial water claims that other countries have. Or if these North Korean fishermen are seeing a way out of the country, uh, basically by, you know, provoking incidents with either the Japanese or the Nor- uh, the Russians uh, to end up going there. Afghanistan, the UN, a UN report finds that uh, the U.S. airstrikes targeting Afghan drug labs. Remember, this is Operation Iron Tempest, which I've been talking about, uh, you know, kind of since the start of it, I believe, in November 2017 on the show, saying that targeting the drug labs would be ineffective. It's just killing people who are more or less civilians. I mean, you know, I know there's this, uh, you know, kind of belief in uh, American society that if you're involved with drugs, somehow you're a more nefarious line of business, business. And so, therefore, if you die, you're a casualty of that business. But there's places like Helmand, Afghanistan, where that's most of the business going on. And so, you know, people work in drug facilities there, you know, opium production facilities. Those are the kind of jobs that you have to have to raise your kids. And so that's where people were. And the U.S. started bombing those. And, you know, the U.N. says these aren't legal targets. You can't bomb drug facilities. Yeah, you know, we don't like that a whole bunch of heroin is being cut out in Helmand and, you know, export other places in the world. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that everybody's life in that facility is forfeit and the U.S. could just blow it up. It's important to remember, too, that I also want to just point out that it's not that the Taliban own these drug facilities. They just tax them. This is the local economy. They're the local government. And so they make tax revenue off it. It's not like, you know, this is the cartel's drug facility. No, this is, you know, whoever happens to, you know, own the land that the drug facility is built on. And then when he transports that, uh, you know, the, the Taliban will get their tax cuts. The particular incident the UN is focusing on is one where there's at least 39 civilian casualties, including at least 14 women and children, and a potential for 37 more casualties. In Iraq, the last week of protests, this is starting about last Tuesday, uh, all the way through this week have killed 110 people. Uh, reports of sniper fire from uh, potentially Shia-linked, uh, you know, Shia militias, but Iran linked uh, Shia militias potentially shooting uh, protesters. So it's a very complicated situation on uh, over there. I'm hoping you know to maybe be able to talk about it in a little bit more detail uh, either later this week or sometime next week. But there's just so many different Shia militias; it's very complicated to understand. I will link to an article by Patrick Coburn in the show notes page. Uh, you know he's in Bad Dad; he's doing great reporting. So. Uh, the way, you know, you're going to get the best information right now is reading him. Hopefully, I'll bring, be able to bring you something on the show soon. I, I did hear that last night, so that uh, would be like uh, October 8th in Iraq. Those protests uh, didn't see any new uh, civilian deaths, so that, that sounds like a good sign. I'll also point out the 110 de- dead between 10 and 20 are reported to be security forces. So it's not only the protesters that are being killed, but, you know, an overwhelming number is. All right, so stories about Syria here. The first one is that the the ship formerly known as the Grace One that was detained by the UK state Lake Gilberter as it entered the Mediterranean Sea a few months ago, uh, eventually being released in this whole kind of tanker feud that the UK and Iran had. Well, the ship was released and set sail, uh, and then, the, you know, the Iran report that the oil was sold. Mike Pompeo is now complaining that it was sold to Syria, which... Doesn't really, but his claim to violate EU sanctions on Syria. So Pompeo is demanding that the EU do something about this. Hopefully they don't, but, you know, sometimes the world empire is able to exert its influence and, uh, you know, provoke conflicts between our allied states and people we claim to be our enemies. All right, talking about Northeast Syria now, this is, of course, the big story. First of all, I guess just starting here, I'm not sure exactly if this means that the U.S. forces are going to withdraw from Syria. It seems that maybe the 700 to 1,000 that are in the area of Syria east of the Euphrates River held by the Syrian Kurds, those forces are maybe potentially being debated taking out. But the actual act that Trump took after his conversation with Erdogan was to remove between 50 and 60 U.S. soldiers, I've seen it reported as special forces, from the 30-kilometer zone along the Syrian-Turkish border 
east of the Euphrates River. So from the Euphrates River to Iraq, along the Syrian-Turkish border, those 30 kilometers no longer have U.S. troops, and there is about 30 to 60 there uh, to begin with. And there hasn't even been any definitive reporting that those troops are actually just now out of Syria or that 50 or 60 U.S. troops left, some, left somewhere uh, that, that's not being reported. So I just want to be clear. You know, this isn't a withdrawal of U.S. forces from Syria, although it has been said that that is being discussed. The other issue is, of course, there's about 300, uh, right, 150, 100, but 300 is the most common number I've read. U.S. forces stationed at Al Tanaf along the Syria and Jordanian border, and that is in the area west of the Euphrates River. Uh, there's like a 55 kilometer radius zone within Syria. So if you look at a map and think 55 kilometers around Al Tanaf, that's what the U.S. claims they control over there. And there they're backed by Syrian air brevels, not Syrian Kurds. Are they're backing, excuse me, not being backed by. So Trump said he was going to do this. Uh, you know, U.S. politicians and everybody come out, all the hots, uh, great episodes of the Ron Paul Liberty Report, good articles being written by people like Daniel Davis, uh, Dub Bandow, basically saying that all the hots are wrong here, that the U.S. didn't have any obligation to the Kurds. You know, we did bat them and we helped them to defeat ISIS, which were just as much of a threat to the Kurds, even more so really than to the United States. Well, you know, the Islamist state were jihadists and were, uh, you know, I think attempting to, you know, encourage lone wolf attacks in the West. Uh, you know, they, they were always doomed from the start. They were always facing pressures from Syria, Russia, Iran, Iraq, uh, the Shia, the Kurds, and were going to be defeated. You know, eventually even the, the local populations that maybe at one point were a little bit more receptive to them over, you know, the, the Shia government in Baghdad or, the Assad government in Damascus, you know, the, those people didn't want them there either. And the, the ISIS, you know, guys were then, you know, on occupation force and that that was never going to last, especially with all these outside enemies. But the U.S. did decide to bat the Syrian Kurds and help them way over extend the amount of land they control in Syria to now between a quarter and a third of the country. Turkey has been outraged by this since the very start. Remember, this program started under Barack Obama, not under Donald Trump. And it involved giving, you know, the Kurds not only a lot of territory, but a lot of U.S. arms. Turkey hates the Syrian Kurds because they see them as being the same group as the Turkish Kurds and their militia, the PKK, which has been fighting an insurgency against the Turkish state for decades now. Uh, I think Turkey pretty much gets it right that there's not a whole lot of separation in the organizations of the PKK and the YPG. And I've certainly gone back and forth on that a little bit as to how much uh, the YPG is influenced by the PKK and that these are the same organizations. But I think they do have very deep ties. And so that's why Erdogan viewed the YPG as a threat. Now, the Turkish plan here, at least what's publicly stated, is for Turkey to go into this 30 kilometer zone here uh, where there are 800,000 Kurds, I think. This territory is fairly important to the Syrian Kurds, but Turkey plans to, you know, roll in with 800,000 Kurds, uh, many of them armed, and I guess establish a safe zone where, one, there are no armed Kurds, which is going to be difficult because, you know, there's main population centers like Kobani in this area, and I would think that the Syrian Kurds would uh, want some kind of defense force for that Kurdish city. The more, I think, disastrous part of the Turkish plan is that they're going to invest billions of dollars resettling millions of Syrian Arab refugees in the area. Uh, this, this seems to be an attempt to create a cor corridor to bisect, uh, kind of, and divide into the Turkish and Syrian Kurds, uh, and then have, I don't know, maybe an occupation, uh, long standing, uh, you know, in here with these Syrian Arabs. I, if Erdogan's able to go ahead with this plan, I'd see it as causing a lot of long-term conflict here, and I'm very concerned about it. People are saying that the Kurds are going to be massacred. Maybe or maybe not. Uh, we saw in Afrin that the Kurds ended up just leaving. Now, I, I'm not in favor of, you know, like a ethnic campaign where Turkey comes in and kits all the Kurds out. And, and, you know, that's certainly wrong to happen. But everybody's saying that it's going to be a massacre and a bloodbath. That, that may go a little bit far as far as what's going to happen here. I see more of a, you know, a small amount of fighting at first, 
uh, followed by maybe a longer term kind of insurgency movement by the Syrian Kurds. Moon of Alabama points out in the blog that unlike uh, you know the areas of northern Iraq or western Iran, you know these aren't mountainous, and so it's not quite as favorable for a group like the Kurds to fight against the the Turkish army, which is very large and very advanced. So definitely, Turkey has started carrying out airstrikes along the border. Their claim is that this is to protect, uh, prevent, excuse me, from Kurdish reinforcements coming in. Um, and a Turkish official and Erdogan have both said that the invasion is going to start and is going to include the Syrian rebels. I wouldn't be surprised if we're seeing reports of Turkey using al-Qaeda forces or, you know, very jihadist uh, radical elements within the force they used to take this area. Uh, You know, first of all, I think it's probably solves a little bit of a problem for Turkey, you know, if they have jihadist forces kind of embedded with theirs. Well, these aren't guys you necessarily want around. So if you could get them killed fighting another enemy of yours, uh, you know, all the better. And at the same time, I, you know, I think the uh, jihadist types have, you know, just kind of an ethnic hatred for the Kurds. And so it'll make them all the more likely to just, you know, go around and kill them for them. The Syrian Kurds have started to signal that they're willing to talk with Assad, Russia, you know, possibly acting as a guarantor in some kind of agreement. Russia also has a relationship with Turkey, recently sold Turkey the S-400 missile system, so maybe some kind of deal gets all wrapped up here. There's also the issue, again, that if we look to the other side of Turkey in the Mediterranean Sea, they're starting some drilling off the coast of Cyprus that's uh, quite causing quite a bit uh, kind of regional tensions over there between Turkey, Greece, Egypt, and Cyprus. And so who knows how much of this uh, kind of plan of what's going on within Syria for Erdogan is also being used as a distraction for ways trying to achieve uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. I've been trying to keep an eye on what other governments are saying. Russia's, you know, saying they don't want Turkey to get involved, but don't seem, you know, to be saying that they're going to stand up and do anything to stop it. Uh, Assad has said that they will see it as aggression and try to prevent it, but unless a deal is done with the Syrian Kurds, uh, I don't see Assad, you know, being the the force that steps in and and prevents Turkey from invading there. Iran has condemned it, and, you know, the UK and even Donald Trump, after approving it, saying that, you know, if anything gets kind of nasty here, he's going to destroy the Turkish economy. So very interesting to see what ends up unfolding. Uh, again, I guess I don't foresee an absolute bloodbath, uh, I'm hoping at least, uh, but at the same time, you know, this is going to be, I think, a longer term campaign by Turkey to kind of uproot the Kurdish population here and put a whole bunch of Syrian Arab refugees in. All right, I think that's all I got for today. Hope you all are enjoying the show, foreignpolicyfocus.libsyn.com, libertarianinstitute.org, at K-Y-A-A-A-L-E. Foreign Policy Focus is the Facebook group and Twitter.com slash K-Y-A-A-A-L-E.